All right, this is rational functions. We're doing five, three through five, six um, in your big book. This is um, rational functions. Rational functions are just um, a fraction of polynomials. Um, and I'm gonna make that an R. A lot of times they use this notation, R of X. Even though it's still just a function, um, they use R of X and um, for rational functions. Um, so all it is is that these two things, both the top and the bottom, are both polynomials. Um, so we're dividing polynomials from each other. Um, And so when we divide polynomials, a lot of funky things happen with the graph. Um, and we're gonna go through this and talk about sort of how we can um, graph these functions, eventually graph them, how we can learn these little tidbits about these um, rational functions and eventually get to um, graphing them pretty accurately. Um, so the first thing that you'll need to know about, pol about rational functions is that they reduce often. Um, so we're gonna just look at some reduction of reducing rational fa functions. You know I can't talk and write at the same time. Rational expressions. Um, reducing, reducing rational expressions is really similar to reducing fractions. Um, it's like reducing fractions. Any common factors between the numerator and denominator um, can be canceled. So as an example, I have the fraction six over nine, which we know can be reduced. And we know it can be reduced because, um, let me pick a different color here, because three times two makes six and three times three makes nine. So we have three times two on, on the top and three times three on the bottom. And those two, th those two threes um, cancel because they're common in the top and the bottom. So we end up with two thirds. That's how we reduce fractions, right? So let's just try this with a rational expression. Um, x squared minus 4 on the top and x squared plus 4x plus 4 on the bottom. Um, so we're going to um, stretch our quadratic factoring abilities today um, because it helps us to reduce rational functions. So on the top here, we have a difference of squares, um, just meaning that we, we need two numbers that multiply to negative four and add to zero because there's no middle term, so it's a zero middle term. And those two numbers are positive two and negative two. They multiply to negative four and also add to be nothing. Um, so we can factor that into x plus two, and I will draw this in green so that you, that, well, actually you'll see in a second. And then x plus two and x minus two, um, we just factored, factored that top. And the bottom, we need two numbers that multiply to four but add to positive four. And those two numbers are x plus two and x plus two. Um, so notice that now that we've factored this, we can tell that there's a common factor of x plus two in the top and the bottom. Um, and then it reduces to x minus two over x plus two. Those two things don't um, reduce because they're separate, they're different factors. So that's the reduced version of this rational expression. Um, so even, but even though those two things cancel right here, um, we also have to just remember that there's gonna be a hole in our function there. Um, whenever there is something that cancels out in the top and the bottom, it causes holes. <clears throat> um, so essentially, even though, even though they cancel, even though these cancel, x still can't equal negative 2. Because as you might imagine, even though, even though those two things cancel, if you were to still plug in negative 2 to this original function, you would still get something that's undefined. Everywhere else it's fine, but you can't plug in negative 2. So we just need to remember that for when we're thinking about the domain of this function, that just x can't be 2. It causes a hole to happen in our function. 
Um, <clears throat> and the things that cancel cause holes, and the things that don't cancel we'll talk about in a second. Um, but those cause holes in our function. Um, so we're going to just practice reducing these some polynomials here. Practice. Reducing some expressions. So our first is going to be r of x equals x plus 3, parentheses, um, over x squared plus 4x minus 21. <clears throat> so the first thing that we should do is f factor the denominator of this function. The top doesn't need to be factored, um, but the bottom does. So the top is x plus 3 still, in parentheses, just because. But the bottom, we need something that multiplies to 21, negative 21 specifically, and adds to 4. And those two numbers, if you want to pause, go ahead. But those two numbers are 7 and 3. Um, specifically, positive 7 and negative 3. So x plus 7 and x minus 3. Um, now that we have that factored, we can see that there is a common common x plus 3 in the top and the bottom. So it reduces to be just 1 over x plus 7. So when you are left with nothing in one part of your fraction, remember that, you, um, that you're still left with a 1. And we just have to remember that x can't be negative 3. That's just part of our domain. We just have to remember that, that there's a hole at negative 3. x equals negative 3. Let's try um, r of x equals x squared minus 9 and x squared plus 6x plus 9. Um, so we need to factor both the top and the bottom of this one because we can actually factor both. The top is a difference of squares. It um, doesn't have a middle term, so we're looking for two numbers that multiply to negative 9 and add to 0, which those two numbers are x plus 3, I mean positive 3 and negative 3, right? x plus 3, x minus 3. The bottom, we're looking for numbers that add to 9, sorry, multiply to 9 and add to 6 because of that in term and that middle term. Um, and those two numbers are 3 and 3. They multiply to 9 and add to 6. So now we can see that there's a common x plus 3 in the top and the bottom. The x minus 3 and the x plus 3 don't cancel. Be careful about that. We have x minus 3 over x plus 3 on the bottom, and we just have to remember that x can't equal negative 3, because if we were to plug in negative 3 to the one that canceled here, we would end up with something undefined, because we would end up with 0 on the bottom of our function, which is not cool. So we just have to remember that that's part of the domain, that there's a hole at x equals negative 3. Um, next, let's try... Oop, my reference disappeared for one second. Our next example problem is um, r of x equals x plus 2 times x plus 3, so this one is already factored for us, which is convenient, over x squared times x squared plus 5x plus 6. So as you can see, any kind of polynomial is allowed to be in these um, rational expressions. Um, I would never recommend unfactoring things. I would never recommend multiplying together these two things. We don't want to know that. We are trying to cancel. We're trying to reduce this. So we're going to just factor this part of it, um, and that will help us to reduce something, hopefully, if there's something to reduce, right? Which on these ones we know there is, but sometimes we don't. Um, so x squared is going to stay separate, but um, we're looking for numbers that multiply to 6 and add to 5. And those two numbers are 2 and 3. 2 times 3 makes 6, 2 plus 3 makes 5. So x plus 2 and x plus 3 is what we have on the bottom. So notice that now we have two common factors. We have an x plus 2 and an x plus 3 that both cancel. Um, so what we're left with is just this 1 over x squared. So it reduced pretty significantly, but remember that we still have to remember our holes here. So x can't be negative 2, and x can't also be negative 3. So in our domain, we now have two holes. One x is negative 2, and one is x is negative 3. Um, because those two numbers cause our denominator to be 0, which is not allowed in math. So those are our, our holes. These cause holes. Um, so things that cancel out cause holes. 
Yes. Okay, the school wanted to interrupt me. Okay, um, now we're going to talk about something called vertical asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes. Um, an asymptote is a line um, that you'll, you'll have learned this in the polynomial lesson. An asymptote is just a line that the graph will approach forever but never get to. Um, so, it, um, so it's important to know, it really, really helpful to know where asymptotes are, especially in rational functions. Um, so our example function is going to be r of x equals 2x squared minus 4 over x minus 5. Um, so the idea here is that this denominator uh, is not allowed to be 0, right? Um, not allowed to be 0. And we can't, it's not like we can reduce this at all, right? Um, even if we factor out a 2 out of the top, um, it's still going to end up being something we can't factor and can't reduce. Um, so this is already completely reduced, and that is important. Um, this reduced polynomial is still not allowed to be x equals 5, right? We have um, an issue at x equals 5, and I'm actually going to change colors here. We have an issue at x equals 5. Um, x can't be 5. And when there are these holes at, um, at points that don't reduce, right? These ones came from when we reduced stuff, then we kept those holes. This one is sticking around. It's, um, it's very important that it's sticking around because instead of making a hole, it makes an asymptote. Um, so I will graph this function really quickly for you just... Um, just so you can visualize here with me. The asymptote happens at x equals 5. x equals 5. Um, and the function, this function happens to look like this. And hang on. it also has a oblique asymptote, which we'll talk about later. Um, but this function will approach that x equals 5 forever in both directions, but never get there. Because at x equals 5, it's undefined. There is no such thing as x equals 5 in this function. So, um, so vertical asymptotes, this is what we're learning here. Vertical asymptotes occur at the zeros, meaning what makes it zero, right, of the denominator. after it's reduced or in lowest terms is a way that you can say that it's a fully reduced once it's in lowest terms um, vertical asymptotes occur at the zeros of the denominator so if you can find where the denominator equals zero then you know where the asymptotes of the function are the vertical asymptotes um, like I just said, there are different kinds of asymptotes that we'll talk about in a minute, um, but the vertical asymptote will occur everywhere that the, the denominator equals zero. Um, good, so there happens to be different kinds of asymptotes, um, and it has to do with multiplicity, which is a word that we used last time. Um, hang on, let me title this. We're talking about vertical asymptote multiplicity Ooh, spelling vertical asymptote mul multiplicity <clears throat> we used that word last time when we talked about um, how many times a zero occurred in a polynomial so um, th it's the same exact idea except for now we're talking about the zeros of the denominator of a function right and so instead of instead of making zeros that occur several times that have a multiplicity we have asymptotes that have a mul multiplicity so there's essentially two different kinds of multiplicity just like there was with polynomials there's odd multiplicity and even multiplicity um, so for odd Odd multiplicities, let me draw for a second, if the asymptote is here, then um, odd multiplicity asymptotes, I don't want that color, will, um, 
will diverge in different directions. So um, one side of the function will approach the asymptote positively and the other one will approach negatively. So they just end up pointing different directions. And this can, can happen either, um, either way, right? It's just di different directions, not which direction occurs first. So what I'm saying here is that this this is odd multiplicity. So if it occurs only once, which is most common, multiplicity, I'm trying to spell. Um, if it occurs only once, then it's an odd multiplicity, which will occur very often, um, or I should say happen very often in our functions. Um, so as I was saying, it can also go this direction, right? This one can go approach to the positive and this can approach to the negative. So there are really um, no rules there as to which direction those two go. Um, later when we're graphing things, we'll s sort of have to like be detectives and figure out which direction um, the asymptotes are approached at. Um, but for right now, the odd multiplicity just means that they approach in different directions. Um, and as you might imagine, uh, even multiplicity means that they approach um, the, same, the same way. So we have two options here. I'm going to quickly draw two more graphs. And two more asymptotes. This one and this one. So it's a possibility that both directions will approach in the positive and, or both directions will approach in the negative. Um, so for even multiplicities, multiplicities, um, they approach the same direction, the same way on both sides, I should say. Um, there we go. So we have odd and even multiplicity. And that will be extremely useful for us later. Um, knowing what the multiplicity of the asymptote is will tell you what, what the graph looks ar like around that multiplicity. And th this only happens for vertical um, asymptotes. Vertical asymptotes are the only ones with multiplicities. <clears throat> um, so we're going to ex um, have some examples here. We're going to find. We're going to find the asymptotes and their mul multiplicity for a couple different rational functions. So this one says y equals x plus 3 over x minus 1. And I will say that these are fully, um, this one is fully reduced, right? We can't reduce this any further. And so um, we're not going to get any fake asymptotes. Um, what I mean by that is you're not going to like look at the bottom and find, oh, there's this number that can plug in and make it zero. Um, but really, it reduced out. And so it ends up being a hole, not an asymptote, right? Because holes come from the stuff that reduces out. Asymptotes come from the stuff that sticks around, the zeros that stick around. Um, so this, this value, x minus 1, equals 0 at 1, right? We cannot plug x equals 1 in there. So the vertical asymptote is going to happen at x equals 1. Um, and it only has the multiplicity of 1, right? Because it only occurs multiplicity of 1. It only occurs once. So um, the let me just draw a really quick picture here. This is not actually a graph, right? But it's an it's a asymptote at 1, and the graph will approach it in two different directions. So we don't actually know if it's going to be down up or up down, but we know that it's different directions because that is an odd multiplicity. Um, our second example is going to be y equals x over x squared plus 4x plus 4. So this one is not quite um, factored all the way. Um, it's hard to just look at this and see what the um, zeros of the denominator are going to be. So we're going to factor it first. We're looking for, I'm going to leave the numerator. We're looking for numbers that multiply to 4 and also add to 4. And those two numbers are 2 and 2. Um, which means that the t there are two, um, well, there's actually one value that occurs twice, right? Um, there's, there's this value of x equals negative 1 that's not allowed to be plugged in, but it's not allowed to be plugged in for two different reasons, right? There's two different factors that are, that are giving us that zero. 
So that means that this multiplicity is now an even multiplicity um, because it has two, right? That zero occurred twice, and therefore it's an even multiplicity, which means the graph of this one will look, um, tiny little graph, at negative two, it will look something like where they approach the same direction. Last example, we have um, y equals x squared minus 9, and then x squared plus 4x plus minus 21 on the bottom. Um, this one needs to be factored a bunch, right? The top can be factored because that's a difference of squares. Um, two numbers that multiply to negative 9 and add to 0 are x plus 3 and x minus 3. So we're recognizing those difference of squares. And the bottom, two numbers that multiply to 20, negative 21 and add to 4, I think we already did that one actually, is positive 7 and negative 3. Um, so we realize that there is a common factor of, and I will just use this color, of x plus 3 in the top and the bottom, um, which reduces this a little bit. But also remember, it causes a hole. So there is now going to be a hole at x equals 3 because we've just reduced that out um, but there will also be an asymptote so let me write out the reduced form here x plus 3 over x plus 7 x plus 7 will give us an asymptote at x equals negative 7 so this is a whole this is an asymptote because one reduced out and the other one didn't um, and that asymptote only has a multiplicity of 1. It only occurs once, so it's an odd multiplicity. Um, so our graph, just to visualize really quickly here, um, we have an asymptote at negative 7, which is back there. Um, and then we just know that they approach from different directions. So one goes negative, one goes positive. Um, but there's also this funky little, there's a hole um, at positive 3 that stays in our graph because, the, because of this number, this factor that factored out. Excellent, okay, so we're also going to talk about horizontal asymptotes. So it turns out there's not just vertical asymptotes, there's also horizontal asymptotes. Um, <clears throat> which actually in all of my graphs I've been drawing horizontal asymptotes just because I am familiar with um, what rational functions look like and I know that they often have horizontal asymptotes. Um, so we're going to talk about how to be really sure about where those are. Asymptotes. Um, so the idea behind this, and stick with me here, the idea behind this is that um, eventually the numbers that x equals are going to be either very big or very small. So like as in the absolute value of x is getting very large. It's getting very far from zero. Um, so we're going to just visualize with this function here, r of x equals 3x plus 2 over 5x squared minus 7x plus 1. So that is a, a rational function. Um, as x gets big, really, really big, um, the the most um, powerful part of this function, and excuse me for using that word, but that's how it works in my head, the, the most um, effective part of this function is going to be the first term of both of these, the leading, the leading term. Um, and that's because it has the biggest power of x that exists on the numerator or the denominator, right? So like, just think about, for example, 2 and 2 squared. So like here, 2 is here and 2 squared is here, right? That difference is not very big. 2 and 2 squared are not very far apart. But now think about a million and a million squared. A million squared is extremely far from a million, right? So it's almost like the rest of this starts to not matter the bigger your function gets. Um, this starts to like, we actually, doesn't actually make a lot of difference. Compared to this value, it doesn't make very much difference. And it's even easier to see on this numerator, like three times a million, like at the very beginning of the function, if you plug in two to that, um, adding two makes a big difference. But if you're plugging in a million, um, adding two makes almost no difference. So it's what we're focusing on here is the leading term of, of our functions, because that's what matters when x gets huge. 
Um, and so what I mean by when I'm when I'm putting these little squiggly equal signs, what I mean is when x and I will put that when the absolute value of x, right, because big and small, gets huge, the function behaves. And we learned about behavior and behavior in polynomials. Um, it behaves like just its leading terms. Um, so just its leading terms are kind of what matter to us after x gets huge. So if we were to rewrite this with just the leading terms, um, we're pretending that this function is absolutely giant and we don't, like, the, in, the rest of the function is insignificant at this point because of just how big x has gotten. Um, once we have that, then we see that, like, 3x over 5x squared reduces, right? There's common factors between the top and the bottom, and it reduces to be just 3 over 5x because one of those x's reduces. Um, this is what we're doing here is just reducing the leading terms. Um, and then if you imagine if you imagine that function, 3 divided by 5x with really, really, really big x values, it's going to be basically 0, right? If you're dividing 3 by 5 times 60 zillion, right, it's going to be basically 0. So um, when I write this squiggly equals zero, I mean basically zero, right? It's approaching zero. The closer, the bigger the x gets, the closer it gets to zero. Um, and I'll write that. When absolute value of x is huge, again, really big, this approaches zero. And it turns out that you can use this reasoning with almost um, any, well, I say almost, but really it's any any rational function. Um, you can use this reasoning. What you're thinking about is when x, the absolute value, gets very, very big. Um, and this just means there is a horizontal asymptote horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So um, because we've decided that eventually this function is going to approach 0 in both in both the positive and the negative x direction, we know that it's going to approach y equals 0, which is the asymptote that we've just found. Um, something that I will add down here is that unlike, and I will write it hopefully while I say it, unlike vertical asymptotes, Functions are functions do in fact cross um, horizontal asymptotes um, sometimes. So so vertical asymptotes are never crossed. Um, the function just gets nearer and nearer to them forever. But horizontal asymptotes are just approached once you get to really big x values and really really small x values. So. Um, So very, very negative and very, very positive values approach that asymptote, but in between there, it's allowed to cross it. Um, it's just a little bit different than vertical asymptotes. Um, they can sometimes cross their horizontal asymptotes. Not always, but sometimes, right? Um, so just to sort of break this process down, because you can use this line of thinking for every um, for every rational function, but sometimes it, it ends up giving you something that's not as um, easy to think about. Um, and so I'm going to give you sort of a table to work by, and um, and this will help you to find, to identify horizontal and also oblique asymptotes when you see them. Um, oblique asymptotes, that's a really fancy bunch of words, but um, all that means is that it's not horizontal and it's not vertical, which means it's diagonal in some way. So horizontal and oblique Oblique, it's also a fun word to say and to spell. Asymptotes, just like asymptotes. It's also a fun one to say. Um, 
we're going to be using this um, this like idea of a rational function here. Um, and bear with me as I just write this for a second. So on the top we have a x to some power, um, and then it just the the function keeps going, right? It's a polynomial, so um, it just keeps going. But because we don't care about the the rest of the terms in the function, we only care about the first term. We're going to leave this as it is, and I'm going to use two different colors um, to indicate the top and the bottom power, right? So the, the biggest power, which we call the degree, we learned that when we, um, let me get that straight for a second, we learned that when we talked about polynomials, a degree is the biggest power in the function. So those two, n and m, are the degrees of the top polynomial and the bottom polynomial. And we will be able to tell a lot from how those two, what relationship those two numbers have. Um, and I'm going to have to zoom out a little bit because our table is um, going to end up being a little bigger than I could see there. We appreciate technology fixing my rectangles. Okay, so um, there are essentially four different scenarios. Um, the first three, let me just keep making this table really quick. <laughs> The last needs just a teeny bit more room, so I'm going to leave that. There we go. Okay, so we have sort of three different scenarios. Um, four, really, but we'll get to that in a second. Um, the first is that m is bigger than n. So the denominator function has a bigger power than the numerator function. Um, we really like that situation, and that's because no matter what, if m is bigger than n, then this function, and I'll write this, the function has a horizontal asymptote at y equals, I need too many colors here, at y equals zero. Um, if you think about that for, for a little bit, you realize it makes a lot of sense. Um, if the denominator is, um, the power is bigger than the numerator, like it's going to approach zero no matter what, right? Because the denominator is gonna get really big, really fast, and the, it's not, the numerator is not gonna keep up at all, right? Um, the other situation, other possibility, let me just copy some stuff here because I am lazy and I'm using technology, um, and also this video is going to be long anyway. Um, obviously, this is not the case for all of them. I'm just pasting it so I have uh, something to work with. <laughs> You'll see. So um, the second scenario that we're going to be working with is if n and n are the same. Right? If m and n are the same power, it's the same power on the top and the bottom, um, then things can get a little interesting, right? So the reason that I have a and b, which are the coefficients for the ter first, the leading terms of um, the leading terms of both of those polynomials, um, if m and if m and n are the same, if the power of the top and the bottom are the same, then if we go through that reasoning that we did on the last page, we end up with um, all of the x's canceling because they're the same power. There's the same number of x's on the top and the bottom, which leaves us with a uh, horizontal asymptote at a fraction, a fraction a over b. Um, we reduced it all the way, the x's disappeared, and what we're left with is a over b. So essentially this fraction um, of of coefficients is where your asymptote is, your horizontal asymptote, if m and n are the same. Um, the next two get a little bit trickier here. So we, we also have the situation where m and n are one apart, right? So if m is bigger than n, um, it's immediately going to be zero, right? The horizontal asymptote is at zero because the bigger x gets, the closer it gets to zero. But if, m, if n is 1 bigger than m, and I'm going to write this like this, m plus 1 
equals n. I apologize for my color switching. It's very important to me. Um, <clears throat> so this is a difference of one, just because I, I, I don't want that notation to confuse you. It just means that um, m and n are one apart and n is bigger, right? The numerator is gonna be the bigger of the two. Um, in that case, we actually don't have a horizontal asymptote. We have an oblique asymptote. Um, and it's in fact the only situation where we will have an oblique asymptote. If the two are, if the two powers, the top and the bottom powers are one apart, and the top one is the bigger, um, then you end up with an oblique asymptote. And we will talk more about how to get that oblique asymptote later. So right now, I'm just going to put the the um, mx plus b, meaning it's going to be a straight line. Um, but it's not going to be vertical or horizontal, it's going to be slanted in some way, so it has some kind of slope. Um, and we'll, we'll do an example of that kind of problem um, later, and I'll show you how to figure out what, where the, asym or the oblique asymptote is. The last situation is, um, is also pretty interesting. m plus 1 is actually bigger than... Okay, wait, I'm thinking about this. No, m plus one is less than n, right? So the difference between m and n are just bigger, it's bigger than one and n is bigger, right? So we have, we have a situation where it's not a difference of one, now it has a difference of more than one. And I'll write that, difference of more than one. Um, in that situation, the function has, is it still the right thing? It is. The function has no asymptotes, no horizontal or vertical or, well, actually, it could have vertical, excuse me, horizontal or oblique, right? Those are the two kinds of asymptotes we're talking about. There, um, there are neither of them. There's no horizontal. Or oblique asymptotes. Instead, with this kind of function, um, we instead pay attention to n behavior. Um, because when there's a bigger difference between m and n, and the, the numerator's power is big, um, for example, like if there's x to the fifth over x squared, right, that's a difference of three. Um, so it turns out that the end behavior is what we want to pay attention in this case because the, the function will then behave um, just like when we talked about polynomial end behavior. Um, this will behave um, just like if you reduce that function. So you can use, again, the same reasoning we were talking about on the page before, um, but it will behave like this function where you have you've basically um, reduced the first terms down to the smallest they can be. Just stop talking so I can write for a second. Um, you've you've subtracted n and m, right? That that is just us reducing x's. So like x squared over x to the third power is just x. What did I say? X to the fifth over x to the third power is x squared, right? Because there's two x's left. Um, so that function x to the fifth power plus something, 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 over x to the third power plus something, 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 its ends will behave like the function x squared. So it essentially looks like a parabola if you squint, um, because the ends will behave just like that parabola. And then it will sometimes do some funky things in the middle, and we'll see an example of that today. Um, so what I'm actually going to do is I'm going to um, highlight these different cases um, in different colors, and then we'll, I'm going to start a separate video and do examples of graphing rational functions using the information that I've given you in these. And I will do one example of each of these situations so you can kind of familiar, familiarize yourself with the different um, possibilities. So this first one, I'm going to just color purple. We'll do one example of that one first, and then we'll do an example of 
um, where M is the same as N in yellow or er, orange, good heavens. And then um, one of where, where there's one difference, which is what we need to talk about with the oblique asymptotes. Um, it's a possibility. And then um, in dark blue, I'm gonna do an example of um, where the difference between the two functions, between the, the degrees of the two functions is bigger than one, and n is the bigger, right? Um, so I'll start, start a separate video for those examples, um, just to sort of 